Okay, so in the first place here, it's been scientifically proven and uncontroversial green check mark in terms of the photographic negativity or quasi negativity. Uh, the, all of, both of these electrostatic mechanisms can produce photo negative images. And you saw proof of that when we had Dr. Giulio Fonti. Here's a, the best results he got in terms of the photo negative image with the corona discharge hypothesis. So green check mark for both the uh, both theories on this front. However, we come into questions when it comes uh, to about the high resolution nature of the images. So basically, um, when I originally studied this in 2018, uh, look, Giulio Fonti has done scientific experiments on the corona discharge hypothesis, and he has proven, look, it is possible to rec recreate relatively high resolution images of hands on a mannequin using the corona discharge hypothesis. But other scientists obviously question the corona discharge's ability to account for the totality of the highly resolved body images, especially in the face, which has that very high level of high resolution um, that's been quantified and scientifically proven by scientists. Um, so here's just a quote from some uh, sh shroud scientists and experts here, quote unquote, because corona discharge is a plasma phenomenon where free positive ions and negative electrons exist in the air glow region, depending upon the free ion slash electron, electron concentrations, well then a level of electrical connectiv connectivity must, conductivity, sorry, must occur. So what this means, look, in general, electrical currents are generated in response to the driving electric field in a matter that tries to negate that field. For example, for a perfect conductor, in response to the driving electric field for a perfect conductor, um, electric fields are repelled by this process from its interior causing the external electric field uh, to be normal at the conduct conductor's surface. Um, another major issue here is magnetic fields are also generated by the induced electrical currents, right? The electromagnetic force, they're linked. Um, and that can further deflect uh, or deform similar electrical currents um, and that sort of thing. So that will hurt the high resolution nature of the images and speaks to the fact that corona discharge struggles to account for the high resolution of the entirety of the shroud's body images. Furthermore, it's not even clear how to determine the significance of such electrodynamic and optical phenomena and to what extent instabilities of the plasma might exist. The point is that the corona discharge hypothesis relies upon what appears to be an unstable physics with a multitude of special variables that are not easy to determine, control, or predict. Um, so these scientists conclude here, trying to use such a hypothesis to explain an image whose macroscopic intensity pattern is mathematically well characterized in terms of high resolution and a global correlation with cloth body distance for the frontal image. So that means the three dimensionality. Uh, having those two features just raises questions and concerns regarding its promise in explaining the shroud. So as you can see, the, there are huge problems, according to these uh, pro shroud experts and scientists, about the corona discharge mechanism, uh, at least on, on an ordinary naturalistic level. And this also applies for Giulio Fonte, as we're going to see in a second, with the extraordinary version, because both the ordinary naturalistic and extraordinary versions of the corona discharge rely on, at least in terms of accounting for the high resolution of the images, rely on physically consistent processes. And the laws of physics uh, make this plasma-based phenomenon highly susceptible to various distorting elements or factors in the environment that can deflect and deform the, the images and result in uh, lower resolution. Now, believe it or not, so Fanti had attempted to address this resolution issue because in his own writings, which again, I'm going to post his articles on my blog for you guys so you can read them for free, but he, he recognizes this and he says, yeah, look, when I, when I tried to get highly resolved images, uh, it sucked. Um, it was horrible. I didn't get uh, the, the greatest results and that sort of thing. So here, here's what Julio says, for example in his 2008 paper, quote unquote, the explanation of the 3D effects 
on the dorsal image in the high resolution uh, could be a problem in the collapse hypothesis of John Jackson, but it is not a problem with corona discharge. The relatively high resolution of 4.9 plus or minus 0.5 millimeters is due to the fact that the electric field lines do not cross each other and the radiation is very directional. Furthermore, it is important to note that higher resolution in the Turin shroud body image is found in correspondence to almost contact areas such as the face and hands. He admits that there is this macroscopic problem even back in 2008 with the corona discharge method. Um, you know, he tries to explain there may be certain issues. Um, you know, one of the main things that he mentions um, is that there, there's an inherent complexity related to what's called the corona discharge distribution law, a law of nature here. Uh, and this just con complicates all scientific experimentation in relation to the corona discharge method and that sort of thing. So um, it's because of this that Fanti's kind of looking at things like motion blurs or ionic winds as possible distorting factors and why he's getting not good results in terms of the high resolution. What What's more here, though, is that, look, STIRP scientist, the credible STIRP scientist, Dr. John Jackson, he's conducted his own scientific experiments to recreate the Shroud's facial images. And, look, he soon discovered that the facial region is very unlikely, next to impossible, to create high-resolution high images when formed with the corona discharge method, even after accounting for motion blurs or ionic winds or some of these distorting features and trying to, to mitigate against them, it's not going to work. It's going to be an utter, utter failure. Now, believe it or not, um, as you saw in our on my last Shroud Wars show where I had Dr. Giulio Fonte himself on, he himself explained, yes, both the ordinary naturalistic and the extraordinary versions of the corona discharge hypothesis, utter, utter failure impossible to account for the shroud's high resolution features and this is after so he he was trying to find out if there's a way to tweak things under these mitigating features he said no it's it's scientifically impossible we cannot account for the shroud with a corona discharge at least in operation by itself as the sole encoding mechanism so he's changed his mind on this he's admitted He's provided his experimental results and he, he gave a photo you're looking up on your YouTube screens of his best results. They're not as resolved as what we see with the Shroud of Turin. It's another failure. And now Giulio Fonti has, as I said, as we mentioned before, he's changed his mind and he's going for a different mechanism, the divine photography mechanism. He's reconsidering things and he still utilizes a corona discharge as a partial explanation or mechanism, but it, it alone cannot account for the Shroud's images. Utter failure in terms of the high resolution there. And actually, I uh, just want to play a clip from that Shroud Wars show where he, Dr. Giulio Fonte himself was on my show and um, said this much that it's a failure on this front in his own words. So, so let's have a listen to how Giulio put it when he was on the show. Experiments uh, in my University of Padua under the guide of Professor Pesavento, uh, in, uh, the, uh, where uh, we have the occasion to put uh, a mannequin uh, representing of, uh, the Jesus of the Shroud, covered by a cloth, and uh, subject to uh, a, corona, a corona discharge. Here is uh, the, the experiment uh, where bluish light was produced. And uh, we have had some results. Uh, this is the best one that uh, reproduces, I can say, all the characteristics, uh, the very pe peculiar characteristics of the shroud image at the microscopic level, but uh, at but micro, uh, micro, uh, at the uh, uh, at the higher level, uh, in, we see that the image uh, is uh, uh, this uh, at the macro level. This uh, image is not uh, so beautiful as that of the child. So uh, a lot of work must uh, be done uh, 
uh, and here to reach the very good results of the shroud. So this is uh, uh, the, the point uh, at which uh, uh, the research on the body image has arrived up to now. But uh, as I have already uh, said, uh, I think that the, the uh, electric discharge uh, called the coronal discharge uh, is not uh, the only responsible of the body image. Probably uh, there were some other uh, facts that uh, helped to produce the, the image that uh, I can call divine uh, photography because uh, it was uh, a miracle uh, at, uh, in the Holy Sepulchre uh, that involved many other uh, facts uh, linked to a, a, a photography uh, not, uh, not similar to uh, the photography that uh, we we you intend now in this period all right so that should do it for julio as you can see bottom of your youtube screen there this is the best results that julio fonte could do with a pure corona discharge mechanism um look, look at the face absolute failure horrible very bad resolution relative to what we have with the shroud of turin which is extremely and been quantified by the incredible stirp scientist to be very highly resolved um so yeah the, it's just not a comparison it is an absolute failure on, in terms of the high resolution uh aspect here for julio fonte so yep uh let's get back to the main recording here so that's very interesting that the the number one proponent in the world and head scientist advocating for corona discharge has now abandoned that uh, theory for explaining the shroud. So that's criterion of enemy attestation. Uh, sorry, Julio, I don't mean to imply you're an enemy, but you get what I mean. Um, in this context, you're an enemy. You were supporting something hardcore, and now you, you're admitting defeat and saying, look, this didn't work. There's, there's some stuff to it as a partial explanation, but I need to change gears. Corona discharge on its own doesn't cut the mustard it just can't do the trick so that's great grand and groovy we've got a failure here for the corona discharge in terms of the high resolution okay well what about the low energy dan spicer's electric charge separation model how does this perform in in terms of the high resolution images well uh spicer uh spicer and totten also address the issue of image resolution in their own article describing their hypothesis. Again, I'm including that article on my blog so you can read it for yourself. Uh, so this is what uh, they state here, quote unquote, the quality and resolution of the image also tells us that the electric field must have been slowly varying in time and space, assuming the body contained within the shroud was not moving due to rigor mortis, during rigor mortis. Later on in that article, he also goes into detail about how his theory utilizes a gas diffusion model. And he, he mentions that, you know, historically, all such gas diffusion models, as we saw, they've been notorious for producing very low or poor resolution images. Um, so he, he replies to that in this front, because this, this is a combination method. It relies on a Maillard reaction. Well, the Maillard reaction in gas diffusion models didn't do too well when we we're talking about the high resolution, right? So he addresses this and he says this, quote unquote, in the presence of an external electric field and therefore the existence of surface charge density, this objection is no longer valid. If the diffusing impurity causing the oxidation of the shroud fibers is a polar molecule. Um, this follows because the surface charge density of the cloth's outer surfaces will act as preferential attachment sites for the impurity polar mole molecules. So Spicer's saying, well, this isn't a problem. Yes, I'm relying on gas diffusion. Those create low resolution images, but because we're combining that with this vertically aligned electric field, uh, that focuses the gas and takes care and, and his method, according to him at least, will produce high resolution images comparable to the shroud. Now, originally when I assessed this, I gave it a pass, I, I, but I've now changed to a questionable status given some 
uh, new features that I've learned um, about this mechanism's ability to actually do what uh, spite the authors of the paper say it is. And great, they can make claims, but it's, it appears that the actual scientific experimentation and evidence, uh, given what we know theoretically about these electrical fields and mechanisms, it wouldn't do what the authors claim it would. So here's uh, some uh, update that I've got uh, got here for it. Quote, unquote, this is from Bob Rucker. He says, quote, unquote, the encoding of the image on the shroud requires that the mechanism that discolored the fibers be controlled by information, right? You've got to control that information. And they're saying, Spicer and Totten are saying, well, the electric field is controlling the information as the gas encodes codes the body images on the shroud. So he continues, so that only certain fibers and specific lengths of fibers would be discolored so that the good resolution front and back images of a crucified man could be formed. Without information to control discoloration, the discoloration mechanism, only a blur could be formed. So this is what we already covered and Dan Spicer himself admitted. At this point, I don't see any mechanism in Spicer's proposal that's capable to transport this required information from the body to the shroud. And then a little bit uh, later on, on April 14th, 2019, he sent me another email. This one's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, the information's important here. So, quote unquote, if the electric charge separation mechanism did form a significant charge difference vertically, as per the electric field that's controlling this information and transplanting the gases into a highly resolved image, and this caused the upper and lower sheets above and below the body to become charged, Therefore, the electric current would um, would have flowed through the shroud and not the body because the upper and lower portions of the shroud are connected by the section of the shroud over the head. So uh, that means that you wouldn't get the body images being uh, encoded on the shroud at all. You wouldn't get highly resolved images or even low resolution body images. Um, obviously, the part on the shroud above the body is not separate. We know this as a scientifically proven fact, right? It's, it's a continuous sheet. It's not like there's two separate sheets totally disconnected, one over top and one below. No, these sheets are wrapped around the head. Uh, it's a closed thing. So therefore what Bob Rucker is saying here is that actually this electric charge separation method wouldn't work because the the electric current would have flowed through the shroud it wouldn't have gone through the body or con transferred information from the body to the cloth at all but bob rucker being the generous pro shroud expert that he is he says let me just help out these shroud skeptics and let's say what would happen if we can just assume for the sake of the argument that uh part the part of the shroud above the body is not separate from the part of the shroud below the body well he says quote unquote but if the upper and lower linen were not connected over the head, any charge difference would dissipate by electrical flow, where the upper and lower portions were in contact along the sides of the body, for example. And if they were not in contact along the sides of the body, being even more generous to these shroud skeptics, uh, but you know they were both in contact with the body, any electrical difference between the upper and lower sheets would dissipate through the body. Um, so yeah, if the body was in contact with neither the upper nor lower sheet, as um, Dan Spicer in figure one of their paper, and you're seeing up on your YouTube screens what figure one looks like on the right hand side there. So, um, well, this would amount in the fact that only a very slight charge difference would occur. Um, and this is questionable itself, but let's say that occurs then it would not be sufficient to significantly accelerate, accelerate any molecules coming from the body so that they could travel rapidly to the sheets and therefore encode body images. No, what would happen instead is that these molecules would undergo Brownian motion uh, by collisions with atoms and molecules that are in the air because they would be moving so slowly through the air or relatively slowly, you know, not as rapidly as would need to be done to create high resolution images and bypass uh, the molecules and things not be affected by Brownian motion and create highly resolved images. Uh, well, that means resolution destroyed. So even 
I mean, Bob Rucker is bending over backwards to grant these Shroud skeptics things that are just impossible to be true, physically speaking. What we know based on the Shroud. I mean, the Shroud is one cloth. It's not two separate independent cloths, one over top of the body and one underneath. Uh, but he just keeps granting them. Look, look, even if this could happen, even if that could happen, what, all of these uh, scientifically falsified assumptions that are physically impossible to be true, let's just grant that. Even still, you would still not get highly resolved images. Um, you you wouldn't the the charge difference would be so slight that this means that Brownian motion would interfere and disrupt the the flow of the gas along these electric charge things. These molecules and uh, particles in the air themselves would create uh, create um, mean that the gas molecules would undergo Brownian motion by colliding with these atoms and molecules in the air and the resolution of the image would be totally lost. You would get a mess. Um, so this is an absolute failure on this front. Um, it, it doesn't work. But continues here just to continue on with his quote. Look, the very low electrical difference between the sheets granting these positive uh, ridiculous assumptions of the shroud skeptics they would not be able to deposit much energy to the sheets so that the single electron bonds of the carbon atoms would not have enough energy to be changed into double electron bonds as Spicer and Totten suggest. And that's what causes the discoloration of the fibers. And if there was enough energy, just again granting the shroud skeptics a, another physically impossible miracle here for their so-called naturalistic mechanism to work, even if there was enough energy to change single bonds to double bonds, which there wouldn't be scientifically or physically speaking, according to the laws of physics, but even if there was, you would still not get high resolution images. In fact, you would get no images at all because the molecules diffusing out of the body wouldn't be able to communicate the required information to the cloth to form the image. They would still be moving too slowly and be affected by Brownian motion to the point where um, they wouldn't, even if they made it to the cloth and were able to discolor the cloth to some effect, they wouldn't be able to communicate the information to create body images, uh, let alone highly resolved body images. So this is just an utter, utter failure. And um, I, I know this is a highly technical um, thing. I, I'm going to be posting up Bob Rucker. I've removed all the personal information and I'm pretty sure Bob will be happy for me to share knowledge with people. So he, he won't mind me doing this. I'm going to share uh, edited versions of his emails uh, to me with all this technical information, uh, critically evaluating Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten's electric charge separation mechanism. So you can kind of go back because I know listening audio, audio wise when there's a lot of technical jargon it kind of goes over your head um, but yeah this way you can sit down and kind of read it and digest all the details and then go over my audio look at the visuals and kind of understand it that way so don't be afraid if, if this kind of yeah ch check my blog page and you'll you'll be able to see kind of a to read something to help you out to understand as well uh, but yeah so high resolution uh, utter, utter failure, I, I think uh, we have to say here. I don't think that we would be able to uh, say that the electric charge separation model accounts for um, the high res highly resolved nature of the images. Um, if you want to be uh, ex if you want to be extremely generous to the shroud skeptic, you might give them a question, a questionable status. Um, that's what I did just, um, because I wanted to be highly generous, but, and, uh, admittedly Bob Rucker, he kind of starts off this advice. I, in context, he's talking about one of the sources, radon gas as one of the th four sources, uh, for the electric field that they're talking about. So I do have an element of questionability. Does this just apply for when the source of electricity is from radon gas during an earthquake, or does it apply just generally for the electric field. And I'm pretty sure it, it applies generally. The parts that I've taken out here apply generally, um, not just when the electric field is produced by radon gas, but for all four of the mechanisms, whenever you have this electric field. Uh, but there is, just understand, uh, read Bob Rucker's comment for yourself in full context. I, I quote him in full on the email so you can see everything that he said. And there is that element of questionability on my front. So that's why I wanted to be extra generous to the 
Shroud Skeptic, but I think to be realistic, I do think that this, this applies generally, regardless of the source of the electric field. Once you have this electric field, it will not create these high resolution images, regardless of what factor, whether the uh, the shroud cloth is a connected cloth, then it'll bypass the body, not producing high resolution images. And if it's disconnected, it will create these problems and be affected by browning in motion and that sort of thing. So I'm pretty sure that it doesn't just apply, but because there's that ambiguity in, in what Bob Rucker was, was saying, and he was specifically in the beginning talking about the radon gas option as, so option three out of the four as the source for the electric field, I wanted to assign a questionable status and be generous to the Shroud Skeptics until I uh, find out for sure and that sort of thing. So let's move on to minimal relevant feature number two. This is about the body image uniformity. And originally, I didn't even include this section in my 300 page write up on the Shroud because I just assumed in favor of the Shroud Skeptics that, yeah, they get all green check marks in my Excel file. They, they are able to account for the body image uniformity. And believe it or not, uh, nothing's changed. I have no update on that front. As far as I know, they all all these mechanisms can account for the body image uniformity, uh, at least as far as I know. I haven't heard any shroud experts give a counter view or anything like that, or any disputes about this. So uh, I just give green check marks. However, I do have an update here that's kind of new, and I had to update my Excel chart to add a new minimal relevant feature. So because this wasn't a part of my original list of minimal relevant features, and I haven't covered it in my Shroud Solo series, I'm not gonna hold this against these theories technically, but I want you to know that there is another physical feature of the Shroud's body images that is counts, qualifies as a qualifies as a minimal relevant feature. It's strongly evidence, it's scientifically proven fact beyond all reasonable doubt in the peer reviewed literature and we have photos of it. And all virtually every shroud expert in the world agrees with this. Hugh Ferry would agree with it, Colin Berry agrees with it. They, they all agree with this as a scientific fact. So it, ha it meets the scholarly consensus criterion for, for being a minimal, re minimal relevant feature. I didn't include it because I, I didn't think of it as being necessary. Obviously, it's not something we've applied to any of the theories, but Bob Rucker in an update does apply this to the electrostatic mechanisms, uh, specifically the electric charge separation mechanism at least, and says that this falsifies this. So uh, if we were to update, um, I've updated my Excel sheet to include this feature and treat it as a failure for the electric charge separation mechanism, um, but I've highlighted it in blue just to kind of make a note that this is an update. This was not a part of my original evaluation back in 2018, but it deserves to be a, a factor or consideration under the body image uniformity here. So, so what am I talking about? What, you know, we had the body image uniformity in terms of the intensity of color, green check mark, both these things pass according as far as I know. Uh, substance uniformity, green check mark pass, it can account for that. Cylindrical uniformity, it can account for that, as well as um, even Mark Antinacci admits that, I think, if I'm remembering what he wrote in his book. Um, and also um, body density, uniform density, the dark darkness of the back and front images are exactly as dark. So the, this passes. However, Bob Rucker has raised a potential issue in terms of the modeled appearance. And you remember Giulio Fonte, you can see up on your YouTube screens, provided a good picture of this that there's only like certain bundles or striations that are colored but then there's uncolored fibers in between um, and Bob Rucker says well look if this mechanism did work uh, let's just say for the sake of argument it did work it didn't produce images that were twice as wide as they should be or something like that it create a wraparound effect as we're going to find out in minimal relevant feature number four Let's just grant all of this. Somehow they can create these images that are highly re resolved and vertically mapped. Um, well, if that was the case, then it would suffer with a problem because the electric charge separation mechanism, as well as the naturalistic version of the corona discharge hypothesis, that would mean that the fibers should all be uniformly colored instead of having a modeled appearance. Uh, and again... Um, 
I didn't include this modeled appearance fact, right? As part of my minimal relevant features approach. So again, I'm not gonna technically hold it against this theory, but just be aware, it, this mechanism would fail to account for this feature. And this does, this feature qualifies as a minimal relevant feature. It is a solid scientific fact, a physical property of the shroud images that these electrostatic mechanisms, at least of the ordinary naturalistic variety, utterly fail to uh, explain. So here's Bo what Bob Rucker says on this front. Quote, unquote, on the shroud, the fibers that are discolored are grouped together on a thread with large portions of each thread having few, if any, discolored fibers. It seems that Spicer's hypothesis would discolor the fibers uniformly across the thread contrary to this evidence. So it's talking about the quantity, all of the fibers would be uniformly colored. Whereas on the Shroud of Turin, only some of the fibers are uniformly colored, whereas others aren't colored at all in this mix. And you can see Giulio Fonti represents this with the his pictures of, of a colored straw versus white straws, a red straw versus a white straw and stuff like that. And so this is an interesting feature, and he's saying, yeah, it's total failure on this front. Um, so this this alone falsifies this theory. Um, and then Bob goes on, I'll, I'll read this. He goes on to explain how his mechanism, his radiation hypothesis differs. Uh, so that's not necessarily relevant to our evaluation here to the electrostatic mechanisms, but just by contrast, he his method actually works given his radiation. So I'll just read that quickly here, but I'll read it again, go over it again when we get to the radiation category, hypothesis or mechanisms properly, and we evaluate Bob Rucker's uh, vertically columnated radiation burst hypothesis. But um, this is just kind of getting ahead. But yeah, so he says, look, in my concept of image formation, encoding the encoding of the image must be a multi-step process to fit the evidence. Radiation must be emitted from the body to carry the required information, the information that defines the appearance of a naked crucified man from the body to the cloth by the energy, intensity, and direction of the radiation. And it had to be admitted within the body because we can see bones on the shroud, including teeth, bones in the hand, etc. Since there was no lens between the body and the cloth to focus this radiation, the radiation must have been emitted in vertically collimated directions up and down, like a billion vertically oriented lasers going off simultaneously within the body. That is the only way, physically speaking, that each point on the cloth can be affected by only one point on the body, the point directly above and or below it, so that a good resolution image can be formed without a lens. I think that the main type of radiation that causes the image is charged particles, protons, electrons, etc. But low energy electromagnetic radiation, such as infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, might have also been a component. To be consistent with what we see on the shroud, the radiation had to be emitted in an extremely short, intense burst, which explains why it only affected the top one or two layers of the fibers in the thread. So that's minimal relevant feature number five, body image superficiality, one of the three levels, right? Um, this intense, extremely short burst of charged particle radiation would produce a strong charge on the fibers in the linen thread of the shroud, which would cause a static discharge from the highest fibers facing the body in the threads which is what the evidence on the shroud indicates. The static discharge from the top sections of fibers in the threads would include high current flow from the surrounding section of the thread to the sparking fiber tips, uh, which produces significant heating of the fiber tips and possibly production of ozone, both of which would then discolor the, the fiber tips. This automatically produces the modeled appearance of the threads with the discolored fibers grouped together where the electrical discharge took place and no discoloration where the electrical discharge did not take place. This is a what Bob Rucker calls a quote-unquote lightning rod effect. I call it this because it is similar to how light, lightning hitting the tip of one lightning rod but no other lightning rods in the area. This can be explained as follows and we're almost, we're almost done. One more paragraph here. 
Assume a fairly level plane, but with some points higher than others, with many lightning rods distributed over it, so that some lightning rods are higher than others. As a thundercloud passes over the ground, an electrical charge builds up between the ground and the cloud. Then the largest charge difference will be where there is the minimum distance between the tip of a lightning rod and a low point in the thundercloud. When this charge different becomes lar difference becomes large enough to ionize some of the atoms in the air by stripping off an outer electron from the atoms, it very quickly forms a cascade of ionized atoms resulting in lightning striking the tip of one of the lightning rods, probably the highest lightning rod. But when this first lightning strike occurs, electrons travel in the earth toward the one lightning rod, thus tending to discharge the other lightning rods on the plane, and electrons travel in the clouds to the one location where the lightning originated in the cloud, thus tending to discharge the other locations in the clouds. This explains why lightning will tend to strike only one lightning rod in a broad area. It is also the best explanation for the mottled appearance of the threads on the shroud, where the discolored fibers are the highest points facing the body on the threads. With the discolored fibers grouped together and other areas of the threads having few, if any, discolored fibers. Uh, so that's his explanation of how electri electricity functions in his theory, his radiation theory, and explains this mottled appearance of the shroud's uniform body image for Brills. Um, but this would not be the case. You wouldn't have a mottled appearance at all under the naturalistic electrostatic mechanisms such as the electric uh, charge separation method that that we're evaluating here. Um, so it's an, it's an utter failure on this feature. Like I said, this was not an original MRF, but it deserves to be such. So I've, I've included it for you guys just so you have that knowledge that it fails this. Um, but I've, I've in my if you're looking at my Excel spreadsheet, I've colored it blue. I've highlighted it blue rather than a red X. Um, just to indicate that, hey, I've made an update here. This is a change. This wasn't part of my original list of minimal relevant features. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next feature, minimal relevant feature number three, the body image three-dimensionality or that topographic information. So on that front, in terms of the corona discharge, Giulio Fonti has proven that 3D images of the hands can be produced using a corona discharge method. Um, that said, some STIRP scientists still question these results, right? So Dr. John Jackson, for example, he's conducted his own scientific experiments, which are directly relevant to Fanti's corona discharge hypothesis. And he's kind of discovered a problem in terms of producing three-dimensional data for the totality of the underlying body. And this is, again, especially pertaining to that facial region. Again, you can't get the high-resolution images. Even Giulio Fonte himself now admits this, right? He admits, I can't produce high-resolution images. By in turn, that means you can't, impossible to produce three-dimensional images as we see on the Shroud as well. And uh, I talked to personal communication with Shroud expert Barry Schwartz on March 23rd, 2018, and he also confirms with his photographic expertise that things like the corona discharge and Curlian photography simply cannot account for the continuous full-length three-dimensional information present on the Shroud's body images. Instead, you would only get steep peaks and valleys on the VP8 image analyzer with no nuanced correlation um, in terms of the subtle levels of elevation of a human face, that gradation there, that fine gradation of levels. Uh, no, you just get valleys and peaks, that's it. So yeah, this feature alone disproves the mechanism of the ordinary naturalistic corona discharge. It cannot explain the three-dimensional nature of the images. Uh, a quote uh, from Dr. John Jackson based on his experiments on, the, on this front, and I, I won't quote all of it, but... Um, such a condition obviously transfers no distance information because only one shading level is recorded regardless of the cloth to body distance. This situation was modeled experimentally by coating the reference plaster face with uh, phosphorescent paint, which when optically charged became isotropic or Lambertian, i.e. through a Lambertian em emitter. 
countered sheets of sensitive photographic film were then placed over the face in a dark room environment to simulate the draping cloth. The developed image was observed to be, unif to be of uniform intensity, consistent with the Lambertian character of the radiation. Thus, in the case of a thin corona discharge layer, a completely unsatisfactory image formed. And as I said, Fanti himself agreed with this totally, both at the time he was trying to come up with excuses, but now as of April 2022, between 2019 and 2022, Giulio Fanti himself is now says, no, it's a failure. There's no excuse. It's just, it can't work. It's impossible for it to work or improbable scientifically for it to account for the three-dimensional images that we see with the shroud. And that's why he's moved on to his divine photography hypothesis instead, a different mechanism. Uh, so yeah, this is just another failure. Uh, what about Dan Spicer's electric charge separation model or theory? Um, well, I assigned a questionable status now. Um, originally, I gave it to it, but I've changed it now to a questionable status, again, based on the fact that it's a questionable status as to whether it can produce high-resolution images. If you don't have highly resolved images, then you don't get these images with the features correlated to both uh, body to cloth distances and uh on that front i don't i don't think i think it's a question uh, as to whether you'd be able to do it but this is what dan spicer says about it in his paper he says quote unquote because the human body is an excellent conductor the distribution of charge on the body surface will provide a one-to-one -one map of a human body's surface when transferred to a flat surface i.e the surface of the shroud cloth that then must also contain this three-dimensional information. Uh, so this is what uh, Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten say in their paper. They claim, no, we can get the 3D information. It must not be a problem. And at the time, I didn't see any theoretical objections. And there, there's a complete lack of experimental uh, results, at least at that time, testing this method. Um, even Spicer and Totten haven't adequately tested or experimented to see how their theory works. So I just gave it a gre assumed green check mark, assume in favor of the Shroud Skeptic and be generous for them. But once again, now that we know that there's a question as to whether they can produce high resolution images, there's also a question as to whether they can produce the 3D images and get that one-to-one -one correlation of body to cloth distance. I'm not sure that they can anymore. So questionable status there now. Uh, so that's, that's that. Uh, great. So let's move on to minimal relevant feature number four. And this is going to be the continuous full length body images on both the front and back sides, uh, non-contact zones, no body side images or top of the head and also the all-important uh, vertically mapped wrapping distortions, that vertical encodation path. How do the electrostatic mechanisms of the ordinary naturalistic variety do on this front? Okay, so in terms of uh, the vertically mapped wrapping distortions, originally back in 2018 or prior to it when I was assessing this as an unbelieving, I gave them uh, a pass here for the electric charge separation model. Yes, it can account for the full length body images, the non-contact zones, it can encode through the air for both the corona discharge and the electric charge separation methods. I also gave it a green check mark in terms of the no body side or tops of the head images at that time. And in terms of the vertically mapped wrapping distortions, um, I assigned a questionable status for Giulio Fonte and a green check mark for the low energy electric uh, charge separation mechanism of Dan Spicer because, look, the, they posit uh, a so called vertically aligned uh, curvy linear electrical field. However, um, with updates, I've now changed on this front and I'm going to play a short clip kind of thing uh, based on feedback that I've gotten from Shroud Skeptic Hugh Ferry. I'll play a clip from him um, as well as Bob Rucker. And now that I have it, I think it's a failure. So the electric charge separation model of Dan Spicer fails to account for this. And it's the same with the ordinary naturalistic corona discharge. The electrical field lines of the curvy linear lines are not perfectly curvy linear. They wouldn't produce ver strictly vertically aligned uh, radiation pulses. As you can see on your YouTube screens, how the electric field lines look when they're vertically aligned. They're not 
perfectly along the same path as a rectilinear or a projection P path, as Dr. John Jackson calls it. And you'll see that in a second um, in a video. So uh, I think it's a failure now. Um, as to the extraordinary hypothesis, I think Dr. Giulio Fonte himself has admitted this is another macroscopic feature that the corona discharge by itself, whether ordinary, naturalistic, or of the extraordinary variety, can't explain. But I, I assigned it a questionable status just because, well, what happens if someone wants to make a modified extraordinary version of the corona discharge hypothesis and says, well, somehow miraculously the curvy linear lines become perfectly curvy linear and therefore it can account for the vertically mapped wrapping distortions. So on this front, it's a failure uh, of, on terms of the ordin both ordinary naturalistic versions and that's what's important for the argument. And it's also a failure with Ju by Giulio Fonti's own admission in terms of the extraordinary versions of the corona discharge hypothesis that have been proposed to date. But again, maybe someone could posit a miracle of some sort that would make the, the electric fields perfectly vertically aligned or something. So if you wanted to make a modified version of it. So that's why I've assigned questionable status for corona discharge, an absolute failure in terms of the low energy electric charge separation model from uh, Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten. Uh, but yeah, let uh, if you don't believe me, let me first play uh, a little clip before I get into that. Actually, I just want to quote uh, something that I got from Bob Rucker on this front. He he sent me several emails about this uh, failure of the electric charge separation mechanism. Um, but he says, um, so look up on your YouTube stream. According to, quote unquote, according to figures one, two, and five in Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten's paper, their hypothesis includes the electric field lines starting perpendicular to the surface of the object, such as the head. Uh, so this is showing the field lines up on your YouTube screen around a cylindrical object like a head, right? And this has the electric field lines spreading out much wider than the object. So you're going to get those slightly wider, like a wraparound effect or like the mask of Agamemnon. So according to his hypothesis, the polar molecules would follow these field lines so that they would form an image of the face that was much wider than the actual width of the face, unlike what we see with the Shroud of Turin, which is perfect, perfectly aligned. So this contradicts with the width of the face as seen on the Shroud and thus disproves the hypothesis. So I'm going to play a little uh, clip that I produced for you guys showing uh, uh, a helpful visual image of this objection. And then I'm going to follow that up with, uh, after that, with a clip from, uh, you don't believe Bob Rucker, he's a pro Shroud expert, right? Well, Shroud skeptics, let me quote your good buddy, Hugh Ferry, because he agrees. Utter failure in terms of the electric charge separation mechanism and the ordinary naturalistic corona discharge to explain the vertically columnated encodation path or these vertically map wrapping distortions. So I'm going to play those two clips for you, and then we'll get back into... Uh, MRF number five. Okay, so this is just a little independent recording uh, regarding minimal relevant feature number four, the vertically mapped wrapping distortions. And um, I wanted to um, bring up this picture just to kind of give you guys a, a helpful visual image of what we're talking about and why the electrostatic mechanisms fail to account for the vertically mapped wrapping distortions as seen on the shroud. So you can see here, this is uh, just an image from one of my previous videos when we were evaluating gas diffusion models. You can see the three paths here. So this is what Dr. Julio, uh, sorry, Dr. John Jackson has mathematically proven that with the Shroud of Turin, it follows the vertically mapped wrapping distortions encodation path P, a rectilinear or perfectly curvy linear encodation path where it's just straight vertically up and on the dorsal image vertically down as, as a straight line. This is what the Shroud of Turin has as a vertical projection path, right? So this is the nose. The Shroud is laying on top of the, the face resting on the nose. There's the cheek of Jesus and that sort of thing, right? So, uh, so this part encoded straight through path P. That's what we have with the Shroud of Turin. Whereas gas diffusion, that would take a uh, gas would puff out from the body, and that would go follow encodation path E. Direct contact is if you press the cloth down to touch this part of the nose, um, well, then it would be encodation path A through direct contact, right? 
So as we saw when we evaluated those ordinary naturalistic mechanisms, uh, the shroud follows path P, so that falsifies direct contact uh, in terms of this mineral oil mixture, and that falsifies the gas diffusion mechanism as well. But with the electrostatic mechanisms, these posit elect curvy linear electrical fields. So it's an, a curvy linear encodation path. Uh, so let me just show what that would look like here, right? So just come very close up so that it's, right? So here's the nose. I think this is good enough. So let me draw. Okay, it's not working. Why can't I draw? Maybe draw, click on draw. Okay, so the electrostatic me mechanisms, in order to be curvy linear, um, it would have to, it bows out, and then perfectly curvy linear, it would have to bow back in like a perfect curveball and end up in path P. So this is what the shroud skeptics are hoping elect electro currents, electrical current uh, curvy linear path would do. But unfortunately, from the um, what we know about the electric fields, they wouldn't be a perfect curveball. They wouldn't end at point P. Instead, what they do, and let me change the color here, um, it follows a path that's slightly not there. So it would be encodation path C, and that's the problem. So the image, it would be slightly wider. It wouldn't be as bad as a direct contact absorption path or a gas emission path where it just puffs out totally. Those are even worse in terms of the wraparound effect or this widening of the face, the mask of the Agamemnon effect where you have this flattened out wider face. But with these elect what uh, Bob Rucker here is saying is that we'll look at the electrostatic encodation paths that we that are being suggested here. Um, so if you have an encodation path, it's not working. Uh, the encodation paths that they offer, it's going to be more about uh, encodation path C. That's right that I've just created right here. And sorry, my drawings are horrible, but it's going to bow out and then curve back in. But it's not going to go all the way and end at point P here to be consistent with the shroud of Turin. It's going to be slightly wider um, and end at this point right here, uh, approximately speaking. And that's the problem here. So we're not going to get this. It fails. They will fail to account for this minimal relevant feature of the vertically mapped wrapping distortions. So that's what uh, Bob Rucker's criticism is. That's what Hugh Ferry was trying to get at when he says, well, I'm skeptical of the ability of curvy linear lines to be perfectly curvy linear, a perfect curveball. No, they're, from what we know of electrical fields, it's, it's going to curve back in, yes, but it's it's going to be somewhat out here, and that will create slightly anatomically incorrect, wa incorrect wide images. They're too wide and kind of spread out, and this will also cause problems with the ability to uh, not encode body side images and that sort of thing as well. So we would expect there to be some body side images, as, uh, as uh, Bob Rucker was saying in his feedback. So I hope that explains that with this helpful uh, visual image here, um, just to you guys. Um, let me just print screen. All right, cool. So with that said, uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. All right, so that didn't turn out uh, the way I was hoping it did, um, apparently. None of the drawings that I made uh, made it through on the Zoom video, despite it working prior. Uh, so once again, the joys of video editing. This one's a bit of a bugger. I've been having to go back and redo stuff and all this stuff, but forget about the drawings. So hopefully you can at least see my screen and you've got the image here. So I was saying that the electrostatic mechanisms, at the very least around the head, a cylindrical like object like a head, would be curvy linear, but they would not go what we see with path P as we see with the Shroud of Turin. It would be more what I called path C. I made that up, right? So you have the gas diffusion, which is path E. It stands for the emissions pathway or gas emissions or diffusion. Puffs right out. 
absorption is if you press the cloth and touches the nose, bring this back down, okay, the absorption path or path A, that's direct contact. That's not what we have with the shroud. No, it's radiation, strict rec rectilinear or perfectly curvilinear path P. I'm not even sure that a curvilinear could result in a path P though. It would all probably only be rectilinear. Um, curvilinear kind of bows out. Again, I, the drawing doesn't work. It's stupid for some reason. Um, but I'm seeing that the electrostatic, like look at these things, right? They kind of bow out and then go straight vertically up, bow out and then straight vertically up. Uh, same deal with the, so this is Dan Spicer's electric charge separation around the head, around a cylindrical object. They bow out, they're not gonna be, that's, path P's up here, but these guys are going up here, path C. They're somewhere in between path A and path P, like around here. And that's what I'm calling point C or path encodation path C to represent the electric charge separation models. And I, I drew a little picture doing that, but again, it doesn't work. So just imagine it. Uh, same deal, here's the corona discharge around the human body. You can see the, they bow out and then they go up. You're gonna get slightly wider images. You're gonna get this mask of Agnememnon. It's not gonna be, uh, as bad, right? But remember in direct contact, we had this mask of Agamemnon effect uh, where it's slight, the face especially is gonna be slightly wider. The direct contact, it's gonna be really bad because it follows that encodation path A. So it's gonna be really wide. With the electrostatic models, it's not gonna be as bad or as fat as uh, good old Agamemnon here. It's gonna be slightly more vertically aligned because it curves out back in into a vertical direction, but it'll, it still won't be perfect with and pristine like what we have with the Shroud of Trim, where it's a straight rectilinear line straight up to path P. So that's the problem that I was trying to get and show in that video. For whatever reason, my uh, things didn't work. But anyways, uh, just because uh, this is taking quite a long time, I'm going to play all the remaining clips all at once um, about the uh, electrostatic mechanisms and how they relate to this feature. So the first thing, first clip to give you guys something different. Uh, so this was my show with Mark Antigonacci and um, Hugh Ferry, the Shroud Skeptic, and Teddy the Bear, uh, Teddy Pappas. And um, I asked both Mark and Hugh Ferry what they thought about Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten's electric charge separation hypothesis or mechanism. And they both said it, it sucked. They both said it didn't work for different reasons. So with Mark Antinacci, he gave a reason under plausibility, not necessarily related to the minimal relevant features. As I understood it, it was a critique given by Art Lind. And I'm going to cover that in specifically around um, the plausibility criterion when we get to our cumulative case considerations and conclusion. But I'm going to play, play the clip of what Mark said now just to save me time because this thing is, is getting annoying having to go back and redo and do little clips there and there. So sorry, I'm just going to be lazy and play it all at once. Um, but what's relevant for minimal relevant feature number four in terms of the vertically wrapped mapping distortions. So remember, here I am, I'm quoting Bob Rucker, I'm giving my uh, thing saying that they wouldn't encode these vertically wrapped mapping distortions, therefore utter failure for electrostatic mechanisms as an ordinary naturalistic versions at least, to explain the Shroud of Turin's images and what we see with the Shroud's uh, path P encodation path. Well, it's not just Shroud, uh, pro-Shroud proponents who think that it fails in this way. Your good buddy, if you're an atheist or a Shroud skeptic, well, your good buddy, Hugh Ferry, also agrees. So let's hear what he, uh, him admit that this is a major problem for electrostatic uh, theories, uh, at least in terms of ordinary naturalistic ones. Um, so here's the clip. Okay. Well, uh, uh, so, so yeah, I'll just ask the last question before it goes to Teddy. I, I promise, Teddy, I know you're being patient there. Um, so this is one that I really wanted to ask because I, I think it's figuring Schwartz and I think it could have worked. And it's you know, presented in 2014 by Dan Spicer and E.T. Where it, it postulates a low energy electrostatic model in combination with something like the Mailer reaction, which will be 
agent. Um, so yeah, we'll start with you, Parker. Are you familiar with Spicer's degree there, and what do you think of that? Uh, a little bit. Um, uh, Bob Rucker has one um, similar to that. He thinks that the, the protons and the electrons create an, uh, um, some type of electrostatic effect. And um, well, I, I just don't know. And then they're just going to have to go with it and, and we'll have to see what the results are. I, uh, I talk, there are other scientists uh, have talked about uh, protons and electrons working together in, in, in a good way and in a bad way. I talked to Art Lynn about this. Um, Art's now almost 88. He's pretty much retired. Um, but um, he always said that the electrons, uh, when they hit the cloth, they would immediately run to the edge, the closest edge where they were. They, they would, have, and they're so, I think they're like about one eighteen hundredth and about one eight, 1,863rd the size of a, of a tiny subatomic proton or neutron. Um, and and he's not big on the uh, on the combination of electrons with protons, and he wasn't wild about uh, Fonte's uh, work in that regard. But that's about all I know. I'm just kind of repeating what what Art told me. Fair enough. Hugh, uh, are you familiar with that, and, and what do you make of that hypothesis? Um, well, it's it's loosely related, I think, to Julia Fonte's coronal discharge hypothesis. So it, it, essentially, you, you have to posit a miracle. And I think that any explanations of miracles are largely doomed to failure, unless they can be made extremely consistent. And I don't think that the electric charge separation copes with the, um, the vertical so the collimation of the image satisfactorily. Yeah, so it doesn't do the, the, the uh, vertically mapped wrapping distortions well enough in your, in your opinion? I don't think so. Gotcha. Yeah, it's like the bit Perfect. Oh, okay, yeah, I just wanted to. All right, so, so there's the clip. There you have it. Uh, in his own words, the shroud skeptic Hugh Ferry admits that uh, the electric charge separation mechanism is not able to account for the vertically collimated encodation path or the vertically mapped wrapping distortions. And therefore, it fails, utter, utter failure. Um, as according to Hugh, also the corona discharge would also fail in this regard to explain uh, this aspect or feature of the shroud's images. One thing I just want to correct about what Hugh said, um, he's, he is kind of confused here. He was saying that, well, this is a, a miraculous image forming mechanism. No, it's not. So, so that is a bit of a note of caution that Hugh isn't 100% familiar with what he's talking about here, because obviously it's in the title, for goodness sakes, it's specifically not a miracle. And they say, we, you shouldn't even have to propose a miracle. So he's different than Giulio Fonte. He doesn't propose an extraordinary mechanism. This is strictly an ordinary naturalistic mechanism, ordinary laws of nature and, and that sort of thing operating. So that was a mistake that Hugh made. Nonetheless, though, he is correct in what he says in his assessment that, well, if it's natural, then uh, bada boom, bada bing, you fail in terms of the vertically mapped wrapping distortions. The electrical fields just won't produce that effect as we have with the Shroud of Turin. So um, straight from the horse's mouth, we've got pro shroud experts like Bob Rucker saying that this is an issue. I, I showed it, you can see with your own eyeballs and common sense. That it would be a problem um, in the video that I, I showed you. Too bad my drawings didn't work. Ar arg. But uh, um, and now you have a shroud skeptic and another expert, Hugh Ferry, backing up on that. Um, Mark Antinacci brought up a totally different uh, objection again. I'll, I'll get into that when we get to the plausibility stuff uh, as to what he said. Okay, um, so just for good measure, again, because I don't want to waste um, time. Finally, I have one last clip of Dr. Giulio Fonte, one of the world's experts and pro shroud experts on uh, corona discharge and electrostatic mechanisms. I also asked him about Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten's electric charge separation mechanism. And 
he didn't really provide too much of a critique or a specific line of attack on it. He just kind of generally mentioned about the plausibility of it. But just so uh, you guys, uh, you Shroud fans, will have all of the clips, every all of the information that I have available to me in making my judgment available in one centralized source. I want to play that clip from Giulio Fonti. So this way, in this one video, you can hear what Mark says, what Bob Rucker says, what uh, Hugh Ferry says about it, what I say about it, and what Giulio Fonte have said about the um, electric Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten's electric charge separation model. You don't have to search various videos and that sort of thing. So, all right, Giulio, over to you. Good question. I, I'd like to get your, your take on quickly there, Giulio. Um, I've just posted it in the chat, uh, but it's for the audience. Um, there's a low energy proposal like by uh, Daniel Spicer and E.T. Totten. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with their electric mechanism. And if so, would you like to give kind of your brief take on that? There are many possibilities. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, I am uh, still uh, speaking of flash of energy, burst of energy, also because I was uh, very positively impressed by the hypothesis of John Jackson. But uh, uh, just uh, looking what happens in the Holy Sepulchre, I was uh, just thinking to uh, not only a burst of energy, but a more prolonged energy uh, production uh, that uh, could be the cause of uh, this uh, body image. Uh, this uh, uh, is uh, also in agreement what I was able to see in the inner of the uh, edicule of the Holy Sepulchre through uh, uh, Greek television who filmed the inner of uh, uh, this sepulcher. In particular, I uh, looked, I saw uh, some flashes of blue energy, uh, uh, blue light, uh, similar to that uh, was uh, described by uh, some patriarchs that uh, uh, described what happened in the Holy Sepulchre. And uh, I saw that uh, the, uh, this uh, um, burst of, of, of energy, this flash of energy, is not uh, uh, so short as uh, I was thinking, but uh, it lasted some fraction of seconds. And uh, uh, now I'm thinking if uh, the flash of energy uh, lasted from, uh, for uh, uh, nanoseconds, uh, as uh, some scientists uh, suppose, or uh, lasted for a longer time uh, of the order of seconds. So uh, there is uh, a lot to, to think about uh, this phenomenon. Awesome. All right, perfect. Uh all right, so that's, that's it. That's all that Julio had to offer. Again, not much of a critique, not too specific, but just He's kind of he's kind of just establishing well, it, it, maybe it's plausible you know originally I just said about a flash of energy in his corona discharge hypothesis because it's a miraculous flash um, but he's saying well I'm open to other lower energy low energy mechanisms that maybe take seconds rather than nanoseconds to to operate or something like that so that's really all all he said he he didn't really get too specifically into Spicer and Totten's specific mechanism and, and um, give an evaluation of, well, how do those relate to the minimal relevant features as a naturalistic explanation? He was more just saying, like with his divine photography hypothesis, he's open to either a flash of energy that lasts nanoseconds, or maybe this energy burst uh, lasted a little bit longer. It lasted seconds or something. And, Therefore, you don't need as high an energy process or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's still, I wanted to play that just so he you had that answer on record. 
with that said, yeah, that's that's it. Those are all the clips on Spicer and Totten that I have from the uh, from the Shroud experts for you on both sides. But uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the recording. Well, in terms of uh, minimal relevant feature number five, this includes the body image superficiality, non cementation of the fibers or threads, and non saturation. So how does uh, how do these models perform on that front? And on, on this front, um, so I gave all, originally I gave all green check marks for the high energy, ordinary naturalistic Corona discharge, as well as Fonte's extraordinary version. So it's able to account for all of this. Same deal with the low energy electric charge separation model of Spicer and Totten. It got uh, green check marks in terms of the superficiality, non-cementation. However, I gave it a question mark in terms of the non-saturation. I wasn't sure whether it could account for that or not. The reason for this is because questionability is because it entails Rogers Maillard chemical reaction. Now, as you remember, it kind of struggled on the non-saturation part, part there. So therefore I, I had a question. I thought it was questionable as to whether or not uh, the, the images produced by the electric charge separation model would show higher levels of image saturation under this type. Um, so that obviously that all just depends. Well, is the Maillard chemical reaction the chemical type or is it some other chemical reaction? What is the coloring agent being postulated here? Whereas with the Corona discharge method, it's, it doesn't rely, it, it colors it on its own. It doesn't rely upon an additional gas diffusion or chemical coloring agent. Interestingly, with the divine photography hypothesis, this also relies on a Maillard reaction. So this might be a questionable element for that theory. To what extent is the Maillard reaction as part of the divine photography hypothesis, is that a fully physically consistent mechanism at play? And if it is, well, then wouldn't it suffer in the same way the Maillard reaction proper suffers in terms of the non-saturation of the images? We, we would expect them to be more saturated based on our scientific experiments using the Maillard reaction compared to what we have with the shroud. Now, there is a bit of an update here. So Bob Rucker questions this. However, I, I will, um, so I, you might say it, it's questionable stat, you might change it to a questionable status. I haven't, I still give the electric charge separation mechanism a green check mark on superficiality. Um, the only reason, so here's what Bob Rucker says, quote unquote, it is hard to see how this hypothesis is consistent with the evidence on the shroud. Why only the outer 0.2 microns of the 15 to 20 micron diameter of the fibers? So that's saying the soup, he's questioning its ability to be superficial on the level of a fiber. Only that primary cell wall of each fiber uh, would be discolored. Why the color would be caused by single electron bonds being charged into double electron bonds of the carbon atoms already in the cellulose molecules why some fibers would be discolored right next to fibers that are not discolored. So that's that modeled appearance. Why only on the top one or two layers of the fibers in a thread would be discolored. So that's superficiality. He's questioning on the thread level, right? Only the top two to three fibrils are colored. And of the fibrils, only the primary cell wall is colored. So uh, Bob seems to be questioning it's this mechanism Spicer and Totten's ability to account for this feature. Now, this came from one of his earliest emails, and he, uh, obviously, Spicer kind of talks about the superficiality and that sort of thing. I'm going to continue to give it a green check mark because I, I think that he could. Bob Bob's advice here, I'm not sure it's an informed criticism. He, he did this very early. This was his first email, and again, I'm, I'm going to be posting up on my blog uh, the email removing out any private details or stuff that I don't think he'd want me to post publicly in that. But for the most part, you're getting all the substantive stuff that I don't think he cares. He's happy for me to share. Um, he hadn't read the article fully in this first email. He just scanned the abstract and then took a look at the figures or tables. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, um, I, I'm not confident um, in like changing the outcome. You might put a questionable element, the fact that Bob Rucker is finding it hard to believe that image superficiality would be attained on the thread and fiber level, fibril level 
given this mechanism, might be enough to pose a questionable status. I'm just going to be g overly generous to the Shroud Skeptic. I'm going to keep it as green check marks. But uh, yeah, check out what Bob has to say about that. Well, check out what Dan Spicer says in his paper on my blog about the superficiality and see what you guys think about it. But I'm not going to hold it against it at this time until I get more de confirmation details. It, it's also telling Bob Bob never mentioned the superficial, superficiality as an issue in the later emails after he actually read Spicer's paper, Spicer and Totten's paper. So, so yeah, like I said, um, for for our the purposes of our minimal relevant features approach, remember, whenever in doubt, I assume in favor of the Shroud Skeptic. So I'm just going to give it green check mark rather than a question mark, given the fact that I know Bob questions things as an ex, as a world's expert, uh, but he didn't follow through on it, and his critique was based on an insufficient. Um, reading or or analysis of the mechanism itself uh it may well be that bob would in fact double down having read it now he would double down and say no this criticism works in which case you can assign a questionable or failure status in terms of body image superficiality but again i don't have those details at this time so i personally am not able to make that assessment and given my minimal relevant features approach when in doubt assume in favor of the shroud skeptic and against my argument in favor of the shroud. So I'm going to keep it as a green check mark for the time being. One last thing in terms of minimal relevant feature number five, uh, this isn't a minimal relevant feature. It didn't qualify, but there is a uh, another aspect here known as the double superficiality. And I linked to a paper by Dr. Giulio Fonte. He's the scientist who discovered the fact that the shroud images, at least in certain areas, like the face, for example, are doubly superficial. So on the reverse side of the cloth, there's a second superficial image of the face of the reverse side of that cloth. Uh, so it's on the front side, the side we see. And then if you take off the backing of the shroud, shroud, there's another image there. Again, this doesn't qualify as a minimal relevant feature. It's highly controversial. It hasn't been confirmed scientifically. But there are science papers by people like Dr. Giulio Fonte that argue for that. And so obviously, as part of my minimal relevant features approach, I can't hold the ability of a mechanism to account for this feature uh, for or against any hypothesis. But just be aware that Giulio Fonte says that the corona discharge hypothesis would be able to account for this double superficiality. So that's uh, an important thing to be in, to be aware of there um obviously some pro shroud experts like mark antinacci or arthur lind they question this and say they're not sure about whether it can account for double superficiality or not so it's questionable there, there's a question there uh, but for our purposes either way we don't care because double superficiality is not an established minimal relevant feature therefore we can't hold the ability to account for this or not ability of a or inability of a hypothesis to account for this uh, for or against any given hypothesis so yeah i uh, just wanted to mention that yeah um okay well what about minimal relevant feature number six the condition of the man those anatomical accuracies uh no decomposition or putrefaction and then all of those blood stain properties so in terms of the anatomical accuracies this is an ordinary naturalistic mechanism it posits Real human body will just give it a green check mark. No decomposition or putrefaction. Um, so, okay, maybe the body was removed somehow from the cloth within a short period of time before sufficient quantities of decomposition liquids formed on the shroud. Uh, great, it can account for that. Green check mark. Both, uh, all of these electrostatic mechanisms. However, when it comes to the bloodstain and body fluids, obviously I think it suffers certain problems here. No, number one, it can't account for the bloodstains and all of their minimal relevant features. As ordinary naturalistic mechanisms, it has to rely on direct contact. That's a failure. Um, likewise, with the curly and photography mechanisms, that's an ordinary artistic mechanism. So you would have to rely on either direct contact or uh, painting or a hybrid, and as we discovered in one of our past Shroud Solo shows, Part 13B, I think, or Part 13, I'm not sure, uh, one of those, that's an utter failure as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, total rubbish. But 
I have something else here in terms of the blood stains that I wanted to mention. There is an, a further issue for the corona discharge hypothesis. It's something that Dr. Giulio Fonte mentions in his 2008, August 2008 paper, and I'll uh, link to this myself. It's in se section uh, 5.8 on page 17. So go to my blog and you can read that paper for free. But Fonte addresses, well, look, uh, let's, we know that the blood, there's no body images underneath the blood stains as one of the minimal relevant features for the blood stains. So this means that, well, obviously, if corona discharge hypothesis, whether extraordinary or nat ordinary naturalistic, accounted for the blood stains, so long as it's physically consistent, then there would be body images underneath the blood stains if the blood stains were transported to the cloth after the corona discharge encoded the body images. Well, the majority of shroud science, well, that's scientifically falsified, so obviously that didn't happen. Okay, well, maybe the blood stains transferred to the cloth first, and then the corona discharge happened and encoded the blood stains, and the blood interfered with the process there. Well, the problem is, if a corona discharge, a high-energy electrostatic mechanism encoded the body images, well, then we would expect there to be evidence of thermal degradation or f fusing in the blood stains. But... You know, this fusing would be an inevitable outcome of any electrostatic model that uses a high energy um, mechanism like a corona discharge. Uh, problem is we don't see any. There's no damage, degradation or thermal fusing or degradation at all of the or alteration of the blood stains on the Shroud of Turin. Oops, falsification, my friend. Well, I, I just want to make you aware that Dr. Giulio Fonte is aware of this criticism, and he does provide a, at least a counter to this. And he, he says in his paper, look, well, in point of fact, on the Shred of Turin, there is some very, very slight, very minor degradation on the Shroud's blood. Nothing major. But this would be consistent with the effects of ultraviolet radiation being exposed during a corona discharge. Um... Thus, according to Fonti, there is no contradiction with the bloodstains being encoded via a corona discharge uh, and the uh, non-thermal degradation or damage or very, very slight uh, damage, as, as Fonte says, is evident on the shroud. That's perfectly what we would expect from if there was a corona discharge, there would be very slight effects due to the UV radiation. According to Fonti, that's what we find with the shroud. Um, what's more, Fante even addresses why there are some off-image bloodstains appear um, that are encoded from the direct contact while the shroud was wrapped around the body, whereas the body images reflect a cloth that was more a blown-out cloth into a blown-out into a flattened position from the effects of the corona discharge and that sort of thing at the time of Jesus' resurrection. So obviously that aspect only applies to the extraordinary, miraculous version where G the corona discharge happened as part of the resurrection of Jesus. That aspect wouldn't apply to the ordinary naturalistic of the corona discharge, and you still have that question. How do they account for the off-image bloodstain? So, yeah, uh, it's an automatic failure for all of these. None of these mechanisms can explain it. With the corona discharge hypothesis, we have these additional problems about the th no thermal not insufficient thermal degradation or fusing of the blood stains, given an ordinary naturalistic corona discharge is supposedly responsible for encoding the blood stains after the blood uh, the body images after the blood stains were encoded. Now uh, the electric charge separation, the low energy theory by Spicer and Totten, on the other hand, this speculates a low energy or low voltage hypothesis. So that would be a little bit more consistent with the lack of major fusing or thermal damage and degradation that we see on the blood stain. So that's not as an issue as it is in the same way with the high energy corona discharge. Nonetheless, Spicer and Totten utterly fail because it's an ordinary naturalistic mechanism and they fail for other reasons to be encoded. Direct contact is the only way to do it um, and direct contact utterly fails as we saw in part 13 or 14, somewhere around there, where, where I go over the direct contact hypothesis, it cannot encode all of the bloodstains, uh, and their 
various features that we have pertaining to the bloodstains specifically. So it's they're both utter, utter failures. Obviously, the Curlian photography would rely, as an ordinary artistic hypothesis, that would rely on painting, and we prove that it, or a hybrid or something, and we prove that those can't be work as mechanisms to encode bl the bloodstains either. Utter, utter failure. And that's in part seven and eight, I believe it is, of my Shroud solo series, where I address the painting hypothesis or a hybrid hypothesis that some medieval artist could use to create the bloodstains. All right, so let's move on to the final minimal relevant feature number seven. These are the additional features. So what's relevant to these electrostatic hypotheses here? So the only relevant additional feature here is additional feature number six. Basically, they found no biochemical or organic substances or burial spices found on the shroud. And in terms of Giulio Fonti's corona discharge hypothesis, either the ordinary naturalistic or the extraordinary variety, it doesn't really bother, matter about this because we wouldn't expect it, right? Fanti, corona discharge is a high energy electric field and that can oxidize the linen by themselves. It, it operates at a near air breakdown magnitudes, right? So therefore it doesn't require the presence of any biochemical molecules to have a chemical reaction to color the shroud images. So I assigned it a pass on this basis. Uh, with Spicer, Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten, however, they rely on a Maillard reaction or a chemical re coloring agent reaction. So in that case, they do need these biochemical gas, gas diffusion model in addition to an electric field operating. And therefore, it's questionable as to why there's no residual traces of these chemical molecules on the shroud. Did they all just happen to oxidize over the centuries? Um, well, I think that's questionable. So what about the divine photography hypothesis? The extraordinary divine hy photography hypothesis re relies upon a Maillard reaction, a chemical agent. So yeah, we would expect these biochemicals to be there. It has the same problem, right? Why have these all oxidized over the centuries? That seems very ad hoc, and it's a questionable element. However, this is an extraordinary, miraculous, and or perhaps supernatural explanation. And there may be, maybe that's part of the supernatural element. You could just say, well, that they were completely oxidized because they, this isn't a fully physically consistent or naturalistic hypothesis. So they were supernaturally removed. And therefore, yeah, it, it would fulfill this element on the Shroud of Turin. Um, but again, that is an ad hoc. I just want to mention that it is from a purely naturalistic perspective or an, um, phys from a perspective of being physically consistent, there is that questionable ad hocness as to whether all of these biochemical or molecules and spices would be totally absent from the shroud, even if it oxidized or decayed or decomposed, the molecules decomposed over 2000 years and that sort of thing. Wouldn't there be any trace remnants or elements in it? Uh, I assign that at least a questionable status. All right, so that does it for the minimal relevant features. Let's get into our cumulative case considerations and conclusions for the uh, for these electrostatic mechanism hypotheses. All right, so let's finish off here with our cumulative case considerations and conclusion. To do that, we're gonna be looking at the best explanation inference criteria, plausibility, explanatory scope, explanatory power, and less ad hocness. So in terms of the plausibility factor. We have a lot to say here about the electrostatic mechanisms. So in the first place, uh, it's incredibly historically implausible, as we saw for the Curlian photography uh, method to work as an ordinary artistic mechanism. Not only were these medievals totally ignorant about photography and photographic plates, they didn't have the technology. They were also totally ignorant about electricity and how it worked. And they were totally ignorant until 1939 AD when we found out about the Curlian effect in particular impossible, historically implausible and impossible for that one to be cr true. But looking at the ordinary naturalistic uh, corona discharge model, as we kind of mentioned before with quotes from Giulio Fonte and, and others, uh, it's theoretically very implausible that a naturalistic, by sheer chance, a ball lightning phenomena, a very rare phenomena that we know a little about, just happened to show up in Jesus's tomb or in, a, in the tomb of a guy covered in a shroud who looks like Jesus and no one else in all of human history and create those images. No, the fine-tuning needed for such a theory 
proves that there's intelligent design behind that. God did it. Um, so the only way this works is if this is an extraordinary mechanism. Um, but there's also another issue in terms of theoretical plausibility here. As noted by various credible STIRP scientists, quote unquote, the corona discharge hypothesis relies upon what appears to be an unstable physics with a multitude of special variables that are not easy to determine, control, or predict. Going on from that, trying to use such a hypothesis to explain an image whose macroscopic intensity pattern is mathematically well characterized in terms of high resolution and a global correlation with cloth body distance raises questions and concerns regarding its promise in explaining the shroud image. What's more, looking at a practical level in terms of the practical implausibility, all artificial attempts to reproduce the shroud images and their minimal relevant features using these electrostatic mechanisms have utterly failed. Uh, the shroud images are entirely unique, and this is admitted by Giulio Fonte himself, for example, with corona discharge. The guy presenting these theories, he says, look, it just can't happen scientifically. Um, and he's now changed his mind altogether and abandoned even thinking that God used the corona discharge as the sole mechanism. He now thinks it's only part of the story at most. Um, so yeah, look, given that phenomenon such as ball lightning in the case of the ordinary naturalistic version as that source of this electrical field is a rare event, naturally speaking at least, and the fact that it is such an unlikely event would have to uniquely encode the body of a person who at minimum was made to resemble Jesus of the Christian Gospels in perfect conjunction with whatever mechanism encoded the mysterious bloodstains seems to stretch the, stretch the limits of the um, available probabilistic resources in order to account for it via coincidence. It just cannot happen. It's impossible that it would be exactly at the right place, exactly at the right time, um, to commit this medieval artist fraud or something like that, or, or just happens to be Jesus or some guy that looks like Jesus covered in a shroud and right there and nobody else in human history. We don't have the shroud of Putin. We don't have the shroud of, uh, Barack Obama, Barack Obama or whatever. Um, so yeah, that it, the Corona discharge model as an ordinary naturalistic mechanism is highly implausible if not impossible. Um, the only way you can get around these fine-tuning issues is by positing divine design. Uh, God can, of course, by design, pop a ball lightning anywhere. Um, so it's an, as an extraordinary mechanism, it fares a little bit better uh, in terms of plausibility. In relation to Dan Spicer's electric charge separation hypothesis, uh, so it has to be admitted that this is a relatively new image-forming mechanism. Um, there hasn't been much to refute its plausibility on a purely theoretical level yet. Um, although um, this was at my, the time back in 2018, now we do have some features that I'll get to in a moment. Thanks to Bob Rucker giving me some updates Mar and Mark Antonacci, for example. But at a practical level, I think we have to say, look, it, it is totally unique. Look, they, and there hasn't been a lot of scientific experimentation, artificial opportunity for duplication here. Um, and it is entirely unique in terms of natural opportunity. And uh, they try to explain this away, Spicer and Totten, and they say, well, there was unique circumstances that happened to Jesus. And that's why only he created these images and nobody else. But artificial opportunity for duplication in a naturalistic context, to this day, that hasn't changed. There still hasn't been a sufficient artificial opportunity because there hasn't been a lot of exper scientific experiments, not even by Spicer and Totten themselves. They didn't do any experiments. It's all theoretical with them in terms of their method. They're not like Giulio Fonte, who actually did real experiments along with other scientists to test the corona discharge. So unfortunately, we're just in the vacuum here. We don't know what would happen. And as far as I have seen, nobody else has done experimental tests for this specific method yet. So we can't say anything about it. Um, so it all comes down to, well, has there been a natural, sufficient natural opportunity is it for the shroud to be duplicated in the, under this method? And 
Obviously, it's unique, and there have been thousands and millions of people who have been buried in linen shrouds over the centuries, and they've existed in earthquakes with radon gas and elect ambient electrical fields. All these sources of electrical uh, electrical fields that they posit uh, happen to millions of people throughout all of human history, and yet we only have this one shroud. It's totally unique. It just happens to be the one that looks like Jesus and or is Jesus. Spicer addresses this and he says, well, look, the reason for this is because, number one, Jesus had an exceptional burial. Number two, the body preparation for burial was unique compared to other people. They were in a rush. They didn't do everything the exact same way. He goes for a partial washing, which is what I do as well. I, I take a partial washing, not a full washing and not a just no washing perspective. And also three, the high quality of the shroud cloth. So this is Dan Spicer's excuse as to why the shroud is unique and he'll say well actually just because there's been millions of other shroud uh people covered in burial shrouds in thunderstorms and all this stuff and yet there's no images he'll say well this is why now one thing i i should mention here that spicer doesn't um one might also say yeah but and we haven't really examined millions of burial cloths either right nobody's digging up graves and examining burial cloths how many have we done? This is the question. Has it been sufficient or not? And then we also need to go into, well, even if they have been a sufficient quantity have been examined, do these factors ab about the uniqueness of the shroud man and his burial and preparation and shroud cloth relative to others, is that enough to show that, well, actually there hasn't been a sufficient opportunity because there haven't been millions of burials that set up these specific circumstances so that the electric charge separation mechanism can work. Now, I want to give a, an update here thanks to the pro shroud expert Bob Rucker who sent me in an email. Uh, this was on uh, what he said back in um, April of 2019. And he said, look, I scanned Spicer's paper, uh, revised May 12th, 2015. And unfortunately, the paper suffers from the same problem as every other paper that proposes a natural mechanism. The problem is, if this condition can occur naturally, then why the heck is it that no other body has been encoded, has encoded an image of itself on the fabric? His proposal is a totally natural explanation by use of the slight electrical properties of a human body in fabric. The Earth's electric field and radon with the possibility of thunderstorms and earthquakes included just in case they are needed. Fortunately, his hypothesis can be easily tested. Find a small underground volume such as a small basement room and lie down, clothes off, with a sheet below you and a sheet above you. Stay there for a long time, perhaps go to sleep, maybe for hours or maybe for days. Uh, I'm not really sure that can happen unless it's a dead body. But uh, anyways, um, anyways, when, when you think you have been there for long enough, get up and check the sheets to see if an image has formed. An image should have formed if Spiker, Spicer's mechanism is real. I bet you a billion bucks you will not find an image because this experiment has been performed naturally millions and millions of times and no image has ever been found on the sheets. Even with lightning and earthquakes, no image is ever formed naturally on fabric. He faces this objection on page 14, section 6. So this is what I just read to you, those three reasons. Bob only records two of them. He, quote unquote, Bob says, quote unquote, he says the reason that no other image has ever been formed is because one, the body was specially prepared for burial. So that includes Spicer had one and two. And then two, the high quality of the shroud cloth. But why should these factors make any difference whatsoever? As a scientist and nuclear engineer, this just makes no sense at all. Dead bodies have been treated in a wide variety of ways over the history of humanity. And we have much finer quality of cloths today than in the first century or the medieval period as well, by the way. No other human body has ever encoded an image of itself on the fabric in which it was wrapped. His mechanism is just not real. It doesn't happen. A boom. So that's Bob Rucker's take on uh, Spicer's sort of excuse as to why only the Shroud of Turin has produced known images in this way, despite his mechanism being around 
for millions and millions of people covered in burial shrouds. I mean, this is just an ordinary naturalistic mechanism relying on regular low-energy electrical fields from a thunderstorm or earthquake. Uh, shouldn't we have discovered at least one of these people? Um, I mean, you know, uh, that that's Bob Rucker's um, kind of approach there in terms of what how he addresses this issue of natural opportunity. And he Bob would say there has been a sufficient opportunity. Um, I'll... <sighs> In terms of my own assessment on this front, ha has the natural opportunity been sufficient to test this mechanism, given the unique, okay, given the unique parameters? Um, originally, back in 2018, I said, I don't think, I think it's been, like the artificial opportunity, I think it's been insufficient. And it's because I didn't have anybody backing me up in terms of the the three qualifications or parameters that only apply to certain burials so we don't have millions of examples of this perhaps we've got like a thousand or or a hundred thousand or something like that it's a subset of the total people who've been buried in burial shrouds and been exposed to thunderstorms or earthquakes and radon gas and stuff like that i, I i'm still i'm still not 100 percent certain uh about this get even so Bob, I think Bob's kind of confirming for me that, well, look, these, these factors don't really make a difference in terms of the mechanism. We would still, we still have that proper reference class. There have still been millions of people. Um, of course, the other factor is, yeah, but it's not like we've examined millions of people. Um, and again, it's, you know, the examples where Bob talks about people alive, that's different than the dead bodies because we're positing circumstances of only dead bodies. So it's a narrower subgroup. Um, and yeah, and the main question is, have we examined enough burial shrouds um, to, say, to say that, yeah, the, the shroud is in fact unique despite a sufficient natural opportunity for duplication. I'm not sure about this. I, I remember when I spoke with my friend Barry Schwartz, he, look, we, we've only really examined a handful. Again, it's not like we're digging up graves every Thursday and checking out the burial cloth, cloths and stuff like that. Uh, we're not digging up ancient bodies um, to look at the burial shrouds all the time. So we saying that we have millions of natural experiments that's a little bit of an exaggeration we haven't examined millions of burial cloths but we have examined lots of them um the egyptian mummies for example the, these images don't form on those bandages um yeah i'm, I'm gonna think this one over i'm gonna uh i'm not gonna give a judgment at this time but once we finish off my all the mechanisms, I'm going to be giving a review overall conclusion uh, for criterion B. And when I get to the mechanistic, when I get to the uniqueness argument, uniqueness despite sufficient opportunity as the second of three arguments to prove that the Shroud of Turin image formation is extraordinary, I'll have an answer for you. I'll have a firm answer for you. Um, I'm going to get to the bottom of this and I'm going to let you know, do I think this uniqueness argument is successful has there been a sufficient natural opportunity to test out spice dan spicer and et totten's electric charge separation model um so yes stay tuned for that i'm sorry to disappoint you i'm not going to give you an answer here now because i'm a little bit iffy uh there's things i there's details i want to know and ask bob about um but yeah i will let you know okay great but Okay, who, care, who cares about the uniqueness argument here? Uh, Bob Rucker has also provided me with some other plausibility issues as well. So Bob, uh, specifically, remember there's four different uh, sources of electrical uh, sources. They, they don't all have to be working. Bob kind of made it sound like in the last comment that they all had to work at once. I, I thought it was more like an or, an either or. So the third of the four options was a radon gas explanation. And Bob Rucker has kind of tackled the theoretical plausibility of using the radon gas as the source for this electrical field and says that's implausible, couldn't happen. 
So here's what he says, uh, again, April 14, 2019. Quote, unquote, Dale, here are some additional thoughts. The radon would not have formed a very thin layer in the bottom of the tomb. It may have been a bit more concentrated in the lower part of the tomb, but it would have mixed with the air due to collisions with the other components of the air, a process called Brownian motion, and thus no image would be formed. But if it did form a thin layer in the bottom of the tomb, the decay of radon would not have caused a significant charge difference vertically because of the very slow rate of decay of radon and the electrical cancelling of positive and negative charges in the air that would naturally take place. So this means that the radon option specifically doesn't work. That wouldn't produce the electrical field necessary to create images on the shroud, and Bob has just totally destroyed that. Now the question here is, Bob seems to be assuming that while the radon explanation is a necessary component of Spicer and Totten's electric charge separation mechanism, that's not how I read their paper. I, I read it as either or, you know, they had four options. It could be either option one or option two or option three, which was the radon option or um, piezoelectric option four. Um, they didn't, they weren't all necessary, they weren't all four, weren't all necessary criterion, criteria. Um, so, so yeah, I'm just going to treat this plausibility issue as at least, at the very least, it refutes option three as a source for the electrical field to explain the shroud. Therefore, you would have to go with one of the other three, one or more of the other th remaining three ones. Okay, finally, another plausibility issue comes from a, a different pro shroud expert, and you heard him in the clip I played with Hugh Ferry when I asked them about Spicer and Totten, Mark Antionacci. And he mentioned, look, he was talking with the retired physicist, Dr. Arthur Lind, one of the world's experts in this area. And uh, Lind raises the issue about the inability of protons and electrons to be able to work together in the way that Spicer and Totten are presuming in order for their mechanism to work. The problems are, number one, the size of the electrons are so small. And there's the fact that the electrons under this mechanism would naturally run to the outer edges of the thread. And if this happened, this means this mechanism just can't work it, theoretically. It doesn't matter what the source of the electrical field is. None of that. This just mechanism, just utter, utter failure. It can't work. It's implausible for it to work at all in the way that's specified in this paper. Um, so that's a theoretical implausibility uh, by Dr. Arthur Lind and reported to us by Mark Antinacci. And again, you heard him. Uh, quote that earlier in this show just go back in the video and you can see the part where mark antinacci says this uh kind of thing so that so that was, those are the considerations on the plausibility i'm going to come back to the natural sufficiency of the natural opportunity issue when we go to our criterion b conclusion in a future shroud solo show so i will follow up on that and let you know a definitive answer at that time all right cool so let's move on to the explanatory scope. Well, as we saw, both Fanti's and Spicer's hypotheses utterly fail to account for the bloodstain images. They all, uh, as ordinary naturalistic mechanisms at the very least, they also uh, fail to encode multiple features. Under our updated uh, list, both of them fa downright fail or are improbable to explain certain features like the vertically mapped wrapping distortions, these curvy linear electrical field lines, at least around cylindrical surfaces like the head and that sort of thing, will produce slightly wider images. They won't be uh, perfectly vertical projection path like we have with the Shroud of Turin in a kind of rectilinear path. Um, electrical field lines are not perfectly curvy linear. They're not perfect. <clears throat> They're not perfect curve balls. The, the catcher is going to have to kind of jump to the side to catch the ball, so to speak. Um, and they fail, certain, you know, Corona Discharge, Fanti is now admitted, it totally fails to explain the high resolution, 3D images, and several of the macroscopic features. Uh, Spicer is also questionable on certain ones like that. So, yeah, uh, there are certain features they just don't even attempt to explain and the features they can't explain. That relates to the explanatory power, as we said. 
This is the qualitative criteria, and they fail as as they fail to account for high resolution, 3D images, and vertically mapped wrapping distortions. These are very improbable hypotheses. Uh, Spicer's electric charge separation method. Uh, this likewise fails to account for the blood stain images and the vertically mapped wrapping distortions, and has several questionable or vague or ambiguous aspects to it under the updated assessment that we have. All right, finally, in terms of the less ad hoc criterion, our simplicity criterion, Fanti's uh, corona discharge hypothesis relies on several non-evidenced assumptions, including assuming that the high resolution images produced through his experiments on single body parts will work to the same effect on the totality of the full size human body, both the frontal and dorsal side images. As we've seen, he's uh, subsequently came out and said that's been falsified. It won't do that. So that's a false assumption. Two, that ball lightning could produce an electrical field around the body and that such high levels of energy would not burn the linen and or greatly degrade or fuse the blood stains, thermally speaking. And then three, there would be a sufficient potential difference between the body and the overlying cloth around it to create the field in the first place. So this hypothesis fails the less ad hoc criterion, especially when we're looking at it from an ordinary naturalistic explanation. It's different when you're having an ex looking at the corona discharge as an extraordinary, miraculous, or indoor supernatural mechanism. Uh, well then, yeah, you can get around some of these ad hoc components. What about Spicer's method, the electric charge separation, low energy method? Well, this mechanism assumes the existence of a strictly vertical electrical field as opposed to what we actually see, the curvy linear are not exactly perfectly rectilinear or perfect, perfectly vertical. Um, and this is opposed to having the interference from the fields running in other directions. Um, it is, now I do have to say with this, obviously Spicer does postulate some plausible examples of ordinary sources for such fields. Uh, but again, these would be privy to interference from fields running in other directions and they're not perfectly vertical as we saw there's a slight curviness they go out a little bit and obviously um spicer's model relies on gas diffusion as some kind of chemical coloring agent to oxidize the shroud's linen and thus create the yellow body images that we see and this is different from fanti's corona discharge hypothesis although it's similar to his new divine photography hypothesis and so perhaps divine photography suffers in this way um but the problem is many scientific tests were conducted to detect the presence of sufficient quantities of these chemical agents and this was not detectable on the shroud yes certain starch traces um or impurities were found in residual amounts on the shroud um but then to presume that all the rest has been completely degraded or oxidized or to assume that that represents a full layer of that on the shroud is an ad hoc component. Um, so on that front, I said that Spicer's method did fail the hypothesis. Um, and obviously the divine photography hypothesis as an extraordinary mechanism, it might, I'm going to remain neutral on that front because again, God doing miracles can do anything. So I'm not going to judge on that front in terms of ad hocness, but as an ordinary naturalistic mechanism, Spicer's uh, electric charge separation method is ad hoc and therefore fails due to these factors. Okay, so that does it in terms of the our assessment of the electrostatic uh, mechanism hypotheses. As you can see, all of the ordinary mechanisms, the Curlian photography is the ordinary artistic mechanism, utter, utter failure, throw that in the garbage. We got rid of that right in the beginning. And then the two ordinary naturalistic mechanisms, the high energy corona discharge hypothesis and the low energy electric charge separation mechanism of Dan Spicer and E.T. Totten, utter, utter failures. They're, they are now unable to account for the Shroud of Turin's body and bloodstain images. And as a result, Woohoo, this is a huge change for me because I thought that Dan Spicer's model, electric charge separation mechanism, did work four years ago. Now with my updated information and access to some of the shroud experts, 
um, I see the error of my ways and I see the flaws of this meth of this method, at least to some extent. Uh, and enough, and that's enough to have a successful mechanistic argument. So look out for that. Um, uh, just by way of an update, because I've done these updates with the electrostatic mechanisms, I've decided to do a revamp because obviously now I do have a successful mechanistic argument, which will increase my overall probability. And due to that, I'm going to do some reformulate formulating um, before I move on with new Shroud solo shows. Um, I want to do an update, a revamp to my 300 page Shroud chapter in writing and make all the uh, updates that I've done made over the years and that sort of thing and then continue on with the Shroud solo show and finish off. We're, we're almost near the end in terms of the mechanisms anyways. So, you know, we've got two ordinary artistic mechanisms left. We've got um, Colin Berry's final 2020 uh, toastograph hypothesis. I prefer that word compared to the, the one he ends with, but it's a scorch, artistic scorch type hypothesis um, that... Uh, I call the toastograph hypothesis in its final version. He's stopped doing experiments in 2020. Uh, he has nothing to do with the shroud. So we're going to evaluate that ordinary artistic mechanism. I'm also going to assess Hugh Ferry's ordinary artistic mechanism and see how that fares. And um, then we're going to get into the final category, umbrella category of mechanisms, the radiation hypotheses. And these come as both in or the last ordinary naturalistic explanation as well as various extraordinary uh, versions of the radiation hypothesis. So we're going to get into that and uh, as well as uh, some massive updates. And when I come back after I finish the Shroud uh, solo series, uh, you'll get my new numbers. I'm also planning on making uh, another argument, completing the vindication argument this summer for in favor of Christianity in light of my updated numbers from the Shroud and my property basic belief from the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to have a new total of Christianity. It's going to be way higher. You know, people always ask me, I was at the time of my conversion in 2018, I was 53.14% convinced that Christianity is true. And everyone's like, well, what is it now? And, you know, these probabilities, I have a systematic approach. It's not like I just update it on the wing or on the fly on a day by day basis. So I could never give them a firm answer. Well, by the end of this summer, you will now have a firm answer. Uh, as to where I'm at. Um, so look forward to that. Obviously, I've got other shows in, in the works as well, like uh, on my God Exists series. Um, but before I can get to that, I, I do still have some promises. So guest show promises to get those, kind of finish those. I'm not inviting new guests, but um, I want to finish the ones that I, I have an arrangement with or, or see how they go. Um, I also have the promise to the Muslim listener, Chewy. Uh, he wanted me to do a review of some Islamic videos, so I promise I'm going to get to that. And I want to finish my Hiddenness of God series in my Existence of God show. That's my next goal um, out of that. But yeah, uh, these are just general things that I'm working on in the summer. Um, oh, I, I also have an agreement with Barry Schwartz. So Shroud Wars, I'm going to be doing another interview with Barry Schwartz. Hopefully I can get Daniel Lowry to be a co-host with me for that show. Um, and I'm Reached out to John Jackson, uh, no word yet, so I don't know if he's interested, uh, and Rebecca Jackson, his wife, if she wants to be on. Um, otherwise, I do have one other show. So there's a new book that's come out on the Sudarium of Oviedo by a guy named Caesar, um, Caesar or whatever you call it. Um, I've reached out to him through the Shroud Science Group and haven't heard back uh, just because he was flustered. So I'm going to try him by email. I would really like to get him and do a Shroud Wars interview specific and or debate if he's willing to talk to Hugh Ferry about it because Hugh Ferry's actually done a review on this book on the Sidarium. But I really want to get to the bottom and have a hardcore scholarly discussion about the evidence from the Sudarium. So, you know, pray for me that if I email him, he'll get back to me because that's a show that I'm actually would be really excited to to get on. And I think it would be val very valuable to get, you know, a... a very specific or advanced level discussion on that topic specifically rather than just you know the pop level basics type deal so other than that yeah uh i'll shut up for now and have have a great week i hope this show is helpful for you guys and take care bye-bye